everyone, and welcome to The Wrap, brought to you by Michigan Medicine Headlines. I'm Dan Elman with the Department of Communication. And I'm Bailey Merzik, Dan's illustrious co-host for the day. Today, we're going to celebrate World Diabetes Day by discussing the important work being performed on the disease at Michigan Medicine. Now, before we get into that, be sure you go back and check out all the important episodes of The Wrap you may have missed. You can find the shows on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or any other podcast hosting platform. New episodes debut weekly, it can always be found on the Michigan Medicine YouTube channel and as part of the headlines we can review. And on that note, let's bring in three members of the Caswell Diabetes Institute who are all experts in their field. First, can the three of you introduce yourselves and explain your roles with Caswell? Sure, so I'm, I'm Martin Myers. I actually direct the Caswell Diabetes Institute, but I do research on obesity and type two diabetes. Hi, my name's Edith Thomas. I'm one of the pediatric endocrinologists. I'm also the division chair for um, our uh, pediatric endocrinology, and I do research on type 1 diabetes, actually what leads into type 1 diabetes for the Caswell Diabetes Institute. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Ling. I am an um, adult endocrinologist, and my research ori is oriented to uh, focusing on behaviors on, around hypoglycemia while using advanced diabetes, diabetes technologies. Great. All right. So, Dr. Myers, let's start with you. Current data estimates that more than 130 million adults are living with diabetes or prediabetes in the U.S. And World Diabetes Day was created back in 1991 in response to growing concerns about the escalating health threats posed by diabetes. So I know that, you know, 1991 actually doesn't seem that long ago. And the work at U of M has been going back a lot longer than that. Can you tell us why the work of the Caswell Diabetes Institute is so important? Sure. So I guess I should start by saying that the Caswell Diabetes Institute per se has only been around for a couple of years, but that the University of Michigan has had really spectacular sort of strong, deep diabetes research for, uh, well, at least 50 years. Um, what the Caswell Diabetes Institute does is sort of uh, parlay off of the really spectacular researchers we have and the, the wonderful both clinical and research infrastructure that we have, all of the, the caregivers, and we think about it strategically. So we think about, you know, what are we doing well? What do we need to do better? Uh, how can we work better uh, across the university and how can we work better with people outside of the university so that everything that's happening here uh, and everything that's happening here, not only uh, is everything here the uh, sort of one of those sum is greater than its parts things, but also uh, that everything that we're learning at the University of Michigan is being parlayed into, um, uh, into uh, changes that affect not only patients here at the University of Michigan, but, but patients elsewhere. Yeah, so a lot of work being done. Can you share some of the compelling research that has come out of the Caswell Diabetes Institute? So there's a lot of it, uh, but I guess if I were to highlight two things, one of them sort of uh, lives on that clinical and uh, research interface. So um, one of the things that has been, uh, and how, uh, Dr. Lin and Dr. Thomas may touch on this, one of the things that's really made a difference in clinical practice over the past few years uh, has been the advent of a lot of new diabetes technology, things like continuous glucose monitors, insulin pumps, so on and so forth. And one of the things that's been very helpful both for clinicians and researchers is that there's now this electronic medical record. The problem that we realized uh, a couple of years ago is that all of the data uh, that is made by uh, continuous glucose monitors, insulin pumps, and things like that doesn't read well into the electronic database. And that means that it's very difficult for clinicians to get at it to help treat their patients. It also means that researchers can't get access to it to actually uh, try to understand better how to treat people with diabetes. And so uh, essentially the Caswell Diabetes Institute partnered with uh, the adult endocrine division and uh, the pediatric endocrine division in the diabetes program that, that Dr. Thomas runs and found a mechanism by which we could take all of this data and actually get it into a usable format for our clinicians and researchers. The other thing I'd like to point out is that we don't just focus on, on type one diabetes research. <laughs> we also focus a bit on type two. Uh, and type two diabetes research, uh, well, so type two diabetes is the kind of diabetes that, that people generally get when they're older. And it is, uh, uh, 
obesity uh, or overweight are one of the things that really uh, sort of lead to type 2 diabetes. There haven't been really good drugs to treat type 2 diabetes for, for many years, but now there are actually classes of, of uh, medicines that are coming out that do a pretty good job. And there's a team here at the Caswell Diabetes Institute. We actually call it the Amigos Group just because it's the, the names of the, of the investigators when you run them all together. That's uh, doing a lot of work trying to understand how these, how these new drugs work and seeing whether there are things that we can do to make them better and reduce their side effects. I love that. So Dr. Thomas, let's turn to you as a pediatrician and as a chair of pediatric endocrinology, I'm sure you and your team, you know, work with many children and their parents and caregivers in making decisions about how best to manage diabetes. What are some of the key themes that you see that, that emerge when you're talking to families and patients and, and how do you try to address them? So the diagnosis of diabetes, regardless if it's type 1 or type 2, is devastating for families. It is a lifestyle change. And there is no more just spontaneity when it comes to eating and when planning to go outside and just do all the activities. And so we really personalize the care depending on what the child and the family needs. And in pediatrics, we take care of kids from birth until they're 21 years of age. So a 19-year-old has a very different need than like a four-year-old. And so a lot of times we're working with caregivers. And by caregivers, I'm not only talking about parents, we're talking about schools, um, nannies, grandparents, and even when they get older in the relationships as well. So we really do try to personalize the care. On diagnosis, we start them on insulin if they're type 1 or on oral medications um, or to insulin on if they're type 2 diabetes. But really, for most of our patients, we're starting them on insulin. And so we start with two types of insulin, a long-acting medication, and then one for like meals and corrections. We try to get everyone on a continuous glucose monitor um, upon discharge because I think that actually calms down a lot of um, families and it calms us out too because then you can know what the blood sugars are doing. So once they go home, we are in constant conversation with them, adjusting their doses as they need it, and then eventually teaching them how to adjust their doses. Um, when the families are ready, we will introduce as much technology as they want um, and see fit. So the first one is the continuous glucose monitors, but then we may move into pumps. There are actually different types of insulin pens. It's actually very exciting, the choices we have now, and it's just becoming more and more exciting. And so um, everything is personalized on based on what the child and the family needs. Yeah, so there's there's a lot of um, these different technologies for managing diabetes. So um, where do you think, where do you see these technologies going in the future? They're becoming more and more complicated, but I think they're getting closer to what our pancreas should be doing. So the continuous glucose monitor checks the blood sugar every five minutes and sends it to a phone or sends it to a pump. And the new pumps with the technology actually will use the blood sugar from the continuous glucose monitor and adjust the insulin doses. And so it's just relieving to know, like if your blood sugar is starting to go down, hopefully the pump is turning off. And so then families will start to sleep and then kids will sleep. And then everyone is just a little bit happier in the morning. So that's what we, that's what we're hoping for. Like we really want to improve quality of life with diabetes. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Dr. Lynn, let's turn to you. We haven't talked to you yet. And, and these technologies that, that everyone's been talking about are amazing, but I know that there's still challenges in adopting technologies, right? And sort of the human behavior factors that go along with it. Somebody has to obviously use it in the right way in order to make the most of it. Uh, what sort of work have you done researching behavioral factors that can impact the use of these technologies? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, so so I, I think uh, I will go back to uh, uh, the, uh, that we're talking about that. Uh, so basically, we one thing I'm a clinician. Uh, so basically, sometimes at times I have been seeing patients. Uh, for example, despite using the most advanced diabetes technologies, they may still uh, experience some, for example, hypoglycemia or low blood glucose levels. And the, the idea behind is that now with the CGM, uh, they have the glucose information with them all the time. And uh, and what happens uh, before they um, develop hypoglycemia and when they have low blood glucose, how do they manage it? So that's so that's how I uh, was led to uh, to to do this uh, these research. So we have done uh, survey research, and also we have done qualitative interview people to get to get to know what actually happens in um in, in uh during the time they have uh, low blood glucose levels. So I, I think I would just bring two things that could be helped to 
visualized it, the seniors a little bit. So for example, for people who have history of frequent hypoglycemia in the past, uh, what they can what can happen is that they may lose the symptoms when they have lows. So when they see the low glucose level information from the CGM, uh, they may not have the symptom to confirm it. So they may not take that CGM glucose information as real. That's that's one possibility. Or the on the flip side uh, is they, they could be seeing the high blood glucose information all the time. And there's an urge for them to control the diabetes, and sometimes they can give themselves too much insulin and cause the lows. So those are the things that we are learning right now, and we're trying, we are developing interventions to help uh, integrating people or technology better to 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 people. And in the future, uh, we thought our research could inform the development of the next generation of diabetes technology. Yeah. So what could be um, a potential next step to address any problems that you that have come up so far off your research. Yeah. So so right now, what we are doing right now is that we are um, developing interventions and we're we're trying to prove that hypothesis that there are certain ways that we can improve the uh, the people's use of glucose information from CGMs or to uh, address the fear of having high blood glucose levels while using CGMs. And in the future, uh, we think that will inform the net what could be the next step on the CGM or the uh, advanced diabetes technologies and how uh, people could use that. Or if that those technologies happen to fail, uh, people will still be able to know what they should do to uh, to take care of their diabetes. Yeah, I love that. Um, you know, this has been a wide ranging conversation. I'm glad that each of you sort of brings a different viewpoint to it uh, because diabetes is such an it's such a common disease right within families. And, and as you mentioned, it's life changing. It completely changes your lifestyle. Um, it can be scary, burdensome for everyone involved, for the caregivers involved. And I know that the Caswell Diabetes Institute is working feverishly to prevent, treat and cure diabetes and the complications that arise from it. So I just want to open this up to the three of you before we end. What are you each seeing as the brightest light on the horizon, the, you know, when you, you're reaching the end of that tunnel and how we can improve the lives of those living with diabetes? From a clinical perspective, I think one of the most exciting things is all of these new technologies that we have to monitor glucose and to infuse the right amount of insulin and so on and so forth. But the reality is it's going to be very difficult to make those technologies actually function like the insulin producing cells in the body. And these are the cells that are lost because of immune destruction in type one diabetes, or just because of uh, all sorts of causes of their failure in type two diabetes. And uh, we have a number of researchers here who are focused on how to actually generate new insulin producing cells uh, in, in the laboratory that could then be transplanted into, into people to essentially cure their diabetes, whether they're type one or type two. So I'm just gonna go off what Dr. Myers was saying. And so one of my areas of research is in trying to prevent type one diabetes. And before you can prevent type, type, type one diabetes, you have to know who's gonna develop it. So we, um, so I am the principal investigator for a trial net here at, U, at the University of Michigan. And what trial it is, is looking at family members of patients with type one diabetes, trying to figure out who's at risk. And if we can figure out who's at risk, can we prevent it from occurring? So we know by the time you get clinical diagnosis, you've already had diabetes for probably a couple of years. And so what trial is looking at is the antibodies, which is the autoimmune um, signal that this is happening. And then in that in those subset of patients, trying to see if we can find some type of treatment to slow down the progression or, or hopefully prevent it. And so that's really important to offer to families because once you have one child diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, you're very scared that it's going to happen to the rest of your children. And ironically, we've even had parents diagnosed after the children have been diagnosed. And so we offer it to all of our families. So I think that is very exciting and hopefully will lead to some change in the way we diagnose. Yep. And the way I see uh, I'm fitting to the group is that uh, we are working towards the cure and also prevention of diabetes. And uh, during the time, uh, I think behavioral uh, science is really important, helping to uh, optimize what people do if they already have diabetes and uh, hopefully maintain their quality of care. I think I was muted. I just want to add one more thing on the tail of what Dr. Lin just said, which is that, um, you know, diabetes isn't just a disease that we treat with medicines, right? Um, there, there are a lot of other components in it. And 
uh, as Dr. Thomas said earlier, there are huge um, sort of uh, mental and emotional burdens associated with having diabetes, both type 1 and type 2. Um, one of the things that uh, Molly Dwyer White, who's our managing director, is doing in collaboration with uh, Brianna Mezek, who's a researcher at the School of Public Health here at Michigan, and also in collaboration with the JDRF Center of Excellence here at the University of Michigan, is try to understand what these psychosocial stresses are uh, and how they affect diabetes treatment, and similarly, how diabetes treatment affects these psychosocial stresses. The idea is that we'll, we'll understand what's going on and we'll understand what we need to do in order to make all of this work better uh, for patients in general. Um, and I think that's really going to be an important thing going forward. All right, thank you all for giving us a deeper dive into diabetes and the important work around it. Um, this was a very good conversation. I think that um, people are gonna learn a lot from this. I know I did. So if you, after listening to this podcast, if you wanna learn more about the work of the Caswell Diabetes Institute, you can go to mmheadlines.org. That's mmheadlines.org. All right, it's time for the lightning round when we ask one of our guests four quick fire questions. Now, Dr. Myers, you lost in a game of Duck, Duck, Goose before the episode, so you are in the hot seat today. You ready to go? I guess I am. <laughs> so besides the job that you're in right now, what would you consider to be your dream job? Oh, man, if I, if I weren't doing this, I would definitely work on a boatyard scraping, painting, and uh, fixing up sailboats. That is fascinating. I love that answer. And that was quick. You knew exactly what you oh, wanted yeah, to be doing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We talked a lot about technology on this episode. What would you say is one piece of technology you can't live without? Oh, my goodness. That's harder. Um, boy, I think I could live without most of it. Um, I don't know. I, I guess I'm going to go with Zoom, you know, but that's not <laughs> that's not my favorite answer. But I'll, You wouldn't I'll be able to be on the wrap if Zoom didn't right, exist. Right. There we right? go. Yeah. <laughs> So this might be interesting. It might be a little difficult. Um, November 13th was World Kindness Day. What oh. is the kindest thing anyone's ever done for you? Ah, okay. Uh, this is going to seem strange, but uh, one day when I was a medical student, I was walking uh, walking across the, the Harvard sort of medical campus uh, and uh, just passed somebody who was going the other way who looked at me and said, hey, that's a great smile. Keep smiling. Wow. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Nice. All right. Finally, Thanksgiving is just around the corner. If you were to build the perfect Thanksgiving meal, what would you include? The, the stuff my mom's been cooking for the past 50 years, uh, 50 or so years. So, you know, it's turkey, it's stuffing, it's her special creamed onions, uh, Brussels sprouts. Um, we have cranberry, even though I'm not a huge cranberry fan. And then we've got to have three pies for dessert. So we've wow. got to have pecan, pumpkin, and apple. Which one's your favorite? I like pecan. Hard not to like pecan pie. All right. Thanks again, Dr. Myers, for joining us today. And thanks to your colleagues for sharing their important work as well. Once again, if you want to learn more about the Caswell Diabetes Institute, you can go to mmheadlines.org. That's mmheadlines.org. And be sure you stay tuned to Headlines the rest of this week as you'll get an inside look at the ongoing employee art exhibition at Taubman Center. And you'll find tips to make sure you're staying as cyber secure as possible while online. You'll find those stories and more at mmheadlines.org. Okay, Dan. So we asked Dr. Myers about Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, more generically, what are your Thanksgiving plans this year? And do you have any interesting traditions that you do around the holiday? Uh, so yeah, Thanksgiving in my family tends to be like the biggest holiday. Uh, you know, we, we always get together typically, um, you know, my sister who lives in Washington, DC, she comes in every other year. My brother comes in from Denver with his, um, with his kids and, and it's a good time. So it's definitely a huge, um, holiday for my family. It turns into a Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night. We're always doing things. Eventually you run out of things to talk about. That's probably the biggest <laughs> tradition. Um, but, uh, and then of course you have to build in watching the Lions lose in the afternoon on Thursday before you start dinner. Uh, so pretty much those are my Thanksgiving traditions. How about you? Uh, yeah. Building off the Lions thing. We go to the Lions game every year for Thanksgiving. Um, it's a great experience, win or lose. Um, we tailgate starting at like 8 30 in the morning we do thanksgiving food and okay. all that and then we go to the game and uh usually it's you know kind of sad after but hopefully <laughs> it will be better 
You never know. You have to have hope, right? <laughs> All right, it's time for the weekly trivia contest. Congratulations to Brian Wu, first of all, who sent in last week's correct answer. Now, as for this week's question, what was the topic of the recent headline story that kicked off an inclusive communication series? Once again, what was the topic of a recent headline story that kicked off an inclusive communication series? If you know the answer, send it to headlines at med.umich.edu for the chance to win a prize. And that's all the time we have for this week. Thanks to all of our guests for joining us today. And thanks, as always, to our listeners and viewers for everything you do for patients, families, and each other. Now, just a quick note, the wrap will be off next week for Thanksgiving. So we wish everyone a happy and healthy holiday. We'll see you next time.